Anyhow, so today we have Lily Verdome here to talk to us about coastal resilience. She's from the Nature Conservancy. That's all I really know about Lily. That gives some background about sure. um, what she's been doing. Okay. All right. Hey, thanks, Kiki. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And um, if you guys have questions, just you know, feel free to ask. We're a pretty small group. And yeah. Where is that? Uh, Monterey. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I'm Lily Verdon. I'm our Coastal Project Director for the Nature Conservancy in California. Um, I've been working at the Nature Conservancy for five and a half years. Prior to being the Coastal Project Director, I was our LA Ventura Project Director. So I worked on the Santa Clara River and then Ventura County and LA County. And now I work statewide along our coast. And I'll be talking about the work I'm doing now. But if you have questions about other local work, you know, feel free to ask too. Um, so I just thought, you know, I see a couple of familiar faces, but usually when I give these kind of talks, I try and start with what the Nature Conservancy is because most people you've hear, heard the name and there's a lot of name recognition, but you don't really understand or haven't heard exactly what we do or have an impression of what we do, and then you hear it and you're like, what? That's not what I thought you did. And <laughs> you know, I don't want, I don't like you guys anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully that's not the case. But so this is this is our mission, and the mission of the Nature Conservancy is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. And we've had you know a, a significant shift. We've been around for 65 years. We're the largest and the oldest conservation groups, so you'll probably hear me say, like, the best and the biggest and the greatest, that's what, you know, we describe all of our work, is we just <laughs> preserve the last remaining and the only, and this, so, um, we are the biggest and, and um, the best, I think, conservation group, and definitely the oldest, and this is what we do now, and, you know, our, our work shifts, definitely, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but really, um, the organization is a nonprofit organization we're a science-based organization and so that's really important to just remember this that we um, are not an advocacy group we don't litigate we are this middleman really that brings people together to solve large conservation issues and we've been doing that since 1950 um, and even before so just a little background so we did we were founded in 1951, but the same people who started us were um, it was like the Union of Ecologists was the name, and they started in 1946. So we've been around for a really long time. And our main work, what the roots of the Nature Conservancy was, was to protect land. And we'd go out and buy large pieces, and that's where like the best and the last and you know remaining um, wild lands came in. And we've done that really well, and we've been very successful. So you can see you know, all the millions of acres and rivers and marine areas that we protected. And what we did really was start the uh, land trust movement. And so you guys are probably familiar with like Ojai Valley Land Conservancy. They're a land trust. Um, there's land trust dotted throughout the country and a lot in California. And um, they are really based on our model is to protect land in perpetuity and manage it in some way or another, but mainly for biodiversity. So, what we've been doing since we've started that is really kind of proven out that idea and now have understood that it's working really well on that small scale level. But I mean, look at where I'm just driving over here and listening to NPR and it's like <laughs> climate change and you know Zika virus and you know all the like bad policy and this is this. I mean, it's not working. It's really you know we're in a pretty bad spot um, and so we're trying to think bigger and push the concept farther about how we can make conservation really work. Here's, um, just point this out. So the organization has over 3,500 staff, including 400 scientists. So if you're thinking about you know, future jobs, organizations to work for, um, this is pretty interesting that of the 3,500 3, staff, we have only 400 scientists, which actually kind of is shocking to me when I came on, I thought I'd be working with all scientists. I work with mainly attorneys right now, <laughs> actually, to be honest. A lot of economists um, and, um, and a, a lot of people with business degrees. And I only work with you know, one or two scientists who I have to like, tap their time. <laughs> and so I'm happy I'm a scientist and that I was brought on, but my job is not in the science shop at the Nature Conservancy. So um, just something to know. So um, we're in a big campaign mode right now this year. 
or the next couple of years on our what we call the worldwide office, so trying to figure out how to raise funds for what we're doing. And part of that is kind of shifting our message. And with big organizations and universities, you're always trying to kind of tap into what is, how to um, communicate your message, what you're doing the best. And so this is how we're doing it now. And it's really tied to the idea that nature is a key part of our lives. Whether you're out in it every day or you're not, it's a key part of your life. And so we're trying to look at nature's value, biodiversity, and how the human impact can all intertwine and can relate to a lot of different people in a lot of different sectors to garner support for our work. And this is why, is like I said, we're in a pretty bad spot right now. And not only do we have, you know, all these issues with you know, climate change and you know the species extinctions and just you know a lot going on, we also have this huge push with people. And we're going to have you know nine billion people by 2050 projected sharing one world with one set of resources. And you know what do we do about that? How do we find solutions that are tied to that? And so this is what you know, our campaign is saying is that the world needs TNC now. And you know, it's kind of cheesy, um, but it's true. We need to have you know, out of the box thinking uh, to address these issues. And it's not about just conservation, it's about how to tie together all of these aspects. And so what we're saying is that we need science, we need on the ground experience, we need you know, more kind of reach and communication to make all that happen. And so that's what we're doing and that's how we're pushing our message out. <coughs> and so we're doing that through that mission that I talked about for protecting the land and the water that people need and that all things need to survive. But really we're looking at it in through this lens, so looking at it through the cl climate lens, looking at it through the land protection lens, looking at it through water, oceans, and cities. And these are all key components of how we can communicate that not only the importance of con conservation just for conservation value, but the importance for conservation for all of these things and to have a more sustainable approach to living and you know, try and reach that 2050 goal without tapping everything out. And so we're really lucky because we've had such great on the ground experience. And since we've been going for 65 years, we're able to really prove this out on the ground. And our place-based work is showing that and making that happen. And you know, we work uh, you know, over 30 countries um, globally. We work all throughout the United States. In California, we have you know, tons of projects. We have everything from you know, legacy preserves that have been there for 50 years that we've been managing to um, policy projects, to interesting things like bird returns, which is um, happening in the Central Valley, Valley which is just buying short-term rights from farmers to flood their property so migratory birds can sit there and stay for just, you know, a couple of days at a time. So we're doing a lot, and that's really allowed us the opportunity to then expand our work and move it past the site-based scale to this global scale. And this is something that you know, I hear constantly from my leadership and from you know, everybody that I'm working with is that we need to scale it up, scale it up, scale it up. And so what does that mean? And that's kind of just the example is that we're here in Ventura County, we're doing, say, you know, conservation at Orm Beach. How does the work that we're doing here then you know, affect the broader community, whether it's in California, or how do the methodologies that we're creating here, how can they be transitioned to use at other places that have similar geographies or similar political climates? And this is that idea of scaling up. And so our work is not just about putting down, you know, buying a, you know, a piece of land and walking away, or buying a piece of land and restoring it. It's about learning how to use that land in the best way we can to inform the community, not only locally, but globally. And we're doing this all over around the world. One of the really cool examples that's you know, usually given with this is um, water funds. And we've been working on water funds. We started water funds, and now they're you know, international. So it's really exciting. So 
my work and how my work kind of fits in with that broader scale um, of, you know, is, is in that climate bucket. And how climate affects us is, you know, we're dealing with climate change on a daily basis all over you know, the world. Our communities are right now. On the coast, we're already dealing with sea level rise. We're seeing you know, issues all the time. This is uh, Hurricane Sandy a couple of years back. I mean, New York was not prepared for any of this, but now they are getting prepared because this happened and it brought to light the need to be you know, resilient and to be prepared for changes like this that are happening now. And really, this, you know, on the East Coast, we are now seeing these types of big storms, and we saw um, Hurricane Katrina in the Gulf. But in, think about on the West Coast, just over the last couple of years, I mean, we've had those crazy um, storms over the summer. Just you know, a couple of months ago, the Ventura Pier was knocked out. We've had um, not even El Nino stuff, but what was like, we had the Navy base was um, completely flooded. It was two summers ago from big storms coming in in the summer. So we're seeing these you know, shifts, and we need to think about what's gonna happen, not only now, but then how to keep preparing and being resilient in the future. And another reason why we're doing that is not just, I mean, my interest, of course I live on the coast and I enjoy it, and I'm out there, and, but you know, I'm a conservationist, I like being outside. That's you know, what draws me to it, I like, you know, that's where I go. And, but a lot of people don't do that, and that's fine. So what works for me might not work for other people, but money is universal. So <laughs> you know, we, can't, we can't really argue with the numbers. And this is a, a study that came out a couple of years ago. And these are numbers for um, global annual flood losses in 10 major cities throughout the world. And so this was in 2008 or so. The um, global annual flood loss was six billion. And then, if you project up to 2050, just at current <laughs> conditions, you know, not taking into consideration anything else, it balloons up to 52 billion dollars. I mean, that's huge. That's a huge number just in these 10 cities. Think about coastal California. We have a couple of major cities: San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco. Everything else. I mean, Ventura, Monterey. Think about all the infrastructure. If we have flood loss, I mean, that's just adds and adds and adds and adds up. It's a huge number. But then you add on top of that sea level rise and the impacts of climate change, and you're talking over a trillion dollars. I mean, that's going to get the attention of anybody. And this is what, this is information that we use to talk to a range of stakeholders about to say, hey, it makes sense to start now and really to push your kind of resilience plan, your community planning forward, so you're not dealing with that. We need to adapt now, so we don't have to deal with that number in you know, 10, 15, 20 years. <coughs> so, kind of circling back to California, uh, we're thinking about, okay, we're in pretty good shape, right? We're, you know, we've, we're in coastal California, we've got a lot of open space, we love it, it's beautiful here, I mean, driving down here, it's like, you know, bucolic with farm fields and the ocean and the mountains, and you, you know, you think, okay, we're doing good. And, you know, the Nature Conservancy up until a couple of years ago thought, hey, you know, we're doing really good too. We've done a huge amount of land protection, and throughout the state, we've worked really hard, we've spent tons and tons and tons and tons of public and private funding to acquire land, and really to focus on the best wetlands because we've lost 90% of our coastal wetlands and you know that's happened that's happened a long time ago and so we're at 10% right now and we've protected a lot of it which is great but then so this is a picture of Elkhorn Slough this is near Monterey so Santa Cruz is just north Monterey is down here TNC this is one of our flagship coastal wetland protection projects we came in we bought it ton of property. So all the green is um, protected property that TNC had, you know, their ha our hand in and protected. We've transferred it since to long-term ownership. The um, dark orange-ish is that protected area. That's coastal wetlands. And then the orange is unprotected coastal wetlands. So, you know, we thought we did pretty good. This looks great. But then if you 
put on top of that the model of projected sea level rise for 2100, all of those coastal wetlands that were protected have transitioned into open water. And that sucks. I mean, that's, you know, our, the reason why we got the funding to buy these properties is because of those coastal wetlands. And now they're open water. So all the diversity, all of you know, the transition lands, everything that, that we got this funding for, the reason why we were engaged in this area was to protect coastal wetlands. And now they're gone, according to our modeling. So um, that, looks, you know, that looks bleak. But uh, you know, if we can't stop sea level rise, which you know, what do we do about that? <laughs> you know, we're trying our hardest. But, um, you know, looking forward, we want to be on top of it. So not only with conservation, not only with development along the coast, but we want to be on top of it with our planning for, um, for uh, nature as well. And so you see these orange areas that have expanded. So this was before, this is um, after, this is sea level, with sea level rise conditions. So what those areas are, are what we've been calling undeveloped uplands. So it's an area, it's, it's, a lot of times it's ag. And those areas are going to transition, if we allow them to, to coastal wetlands. So there is some hope here, which is great. So the um, coastal team, the California coastal team with the Nature Conservancy, which I'm like one of three members of, so <laughs> we're like lean and mean, <laughs> we, uh, we have run those numbers, we're looking at this, and we're saying, hey, well, you know, we need to get out there and we need to do something about this. And so our approach is to use the best available science to guide protecting where coastal habitats are today, where they will be in the future, and then also reclamation. So reclamation is kind of a nice word for manage retreat. And uh, we're trying <laughs> to soften that a little bit. <laughs> but um, that's the reality that we're facing now. And so we can't go out there with our traditional approach to just assessing habitat stagnant as it is now, which is what we've done. And we're really good. The Nature Conservancy, what we do, we've, and we've always done it, and we're still doing it, is we plan. And we're great at planning. And so we create conservation action plans. We create you know, reserve plans. We do all of this. And, um, but what that hasn't done is included future, or, you know, um, the future conditions. And so that's what we're looking at now. So what's at stake? And we're at like, how many acres are we dealing with? And we had 2 million acres of coastal wetlands. And now we're at 173,000. So that's that 90% loss. So I mean, that's huge already. And then if you think about with sea level rise, you know, dropping that down, that there's a lot at potentially at stake. And if you think about you know, all of the you know, marine life that, that depends on coastal wetlands, their estuaries, their transition zones, their nurseries, it's massive. So that's a lot at stake. And not only is it the conservation value at stake, but think about how, what an important area that wetlands play for the protection of communities as well. And I think that's best described in like, you know, that we see it a lot in like the Gulf Coast with um, barrier islands and wetlands that then protect flooding um, and communities that are built you know, away from the shoreline are better protected during storm events. So this is what's at stake. So if we don't do anything and we let sea level rise happen and we don't go after any you know, future habitat that could play a part in you know, transitioning, we're going to end up with 103,000 acres. And this is all modeling. So you know, it's like give or take you know, whatever your strength of your model is. Um, but 103,000 acres of coastal wetlands. So I mean, that's, that's not a lot. We went from 2 million to 103,000 acres in you know, 200 years. That's pretty sad. But you know, we're very, the Nature Conservancy, we're optimists. And so we're always trying to find, we're solution oriented. So that's what we're doing. So if we protect existing habitat and undeveloped uplands, so again, those like ag lands that are transitioning, then we can add an additional 54,000 acres. And if we protect existing habitat, undeveloped uplands, and have strategic retreat, managed retreat, 
in just under 20,000 acres, we could achieve no net loss. So <laughs> that's back to 173,000 acres. And I know it's kind of a sad thing, no net loss, but it's really a big you know, gain. It would be huge not to lose coastal wetlands. You know, that we're definitely not at the biggest and the best anymore, but we're just like, hey, let's maintain. You know? Let's keep it where it is. And that's our goal for now. And that's a big thing to bite off just in the state. And so we're, we're trying to think about how to do that, how to best um, deploy this, and you know, how we can do it with just really three people working on it, how we can use that scaling up theory. How can we use that to get this um, to maintain at 173 acres with everything, or 173,000 acres with everything that we're facing. So again, this is our position. We're going to be protecting it where it is now. So example of that, Ormond Beach, just outside your back door, protecting it where it will be. Again, Ormond Beach, just outside your back door. Think about all those ag lands that are just built up by the um, coast. Perfect. That's undeveloped wetlands and strategic retreat. Again, <laughs> think about Ormond Beach, think about the Superfund site and the power plant that are out there that are surrounded by an open space. You know, aging, outdated infrastructure and a toxic waste site. Hmm. Perfect things to move out of the way, <laughs> get out of the community and you know, restore to coastal wetlands that can then you know, absorb floodwaters you know, promote all these endangered species and the recovery and birds and all that have you know public access and you know provide this natural infrastructure. Um, and so instead of building levees to protect our coastline, we're putting dunes out there, stopping the water, letting it go, move in more of an easy way, um, not fighting it so much. So this is our approach. Um, we're sticking with it, and we, we're hoping that it's working. But this is our issue is that we can only get that to work if we change the minds of the coastal developers and the regulators and it, the kind of general lexicon of that this is what people do. To protect the coastline and to protect the rivers, there it's easy for people to go out and build levees, not very easy, but it, it's, you know, it's easy enough <laughs> to go out, do riprap, do um, you know, hardened infrastructure, what we call gray infrastructure. This is the go-to. So how do we go from this to this? And this is really what, what we're saying is working. And so, you know, we're saying that where you can do this, and it's not only the better economic choice, it lasts for, you know, in perpetuity. It has a multi-benefit approach to conservation and to economics, it brings in people, it brings in nature, and it's, you know, this is a win-win solution. But, you know, again, what we're coming up against is that we need to really prove it out and make it part of the tool book, because right now, what coastal communities are seeing is they're working with, you know, Army Corps of Engineers and other folks who have manuals to build a seawall. So, you know, if I had the permits and everything, I could just, you know, hand this manual over to you know, my <coughs> contractor. They can go out and build a seawall in a couple of days. They know the specs, they know how much it's going to cost, they can get the materials done. But we don't have that for what we call natural infrastructure or nature based approaches. People don't know how to use a wetland or a dune system to protect, you know, communities or you know, restore an area to help use, you know, to um, help kind of divert water and protect areas for managed retreat. We don't have that. We don't have, you know, we're just starting to kind of develop this, develop the methodology, pull it all together. And so this is something that we're working on, not only in California, but the Nature Conservancy is actually working with the Army Corps of Engineers to build this, um, you know, th this information to inform a manual. And it might seem kind of like, whoa, that seems way off. You know, how do you actually do that? How do you make that change happen? And, but we did it not too long ago with restoration. So you know, 10 years or so ago, Army Corps of Engineers didn't have a manual for how to do restoration. And they need to do restoration. They need to do compensatory mitigation when they're building things. It's the law. 
they didn't know how to do it. And we worked with them, Nature Conservancy did on our global level, and helped develop a manual just like this for restoration. So we're, why can't we do that now with natural infrastructure? And so all of the work that we're doing is that scaling up again. This, we need to prove it out somewhere, make it work, make the methodology strong, show that it works, show that the numbers play out, and then inform you know, manuals like this so you have a body of information that then can be used and used other places. So um, how are we going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and one way that we're going to do that is through coastal resilience. So, um, you know, about 10 or so years ago, again, that 10 years number comes up, but like maybe even, yeah, it's probably about eight years ago, <coughs> we were, you know, I was communicating as a scientist using bar charts and spaghetti diagrams and graphs and trying to show, you know, a, a broad range of audience. This is what sea level rise and climate change looks like. Can you visualize it? And, you know, I'm like, I I don't really know, and I, you know, I, it's hard for me to understand that too because you're looking at something, and most people want to be asked, you know, well, what does it really look like? Are my feet wet part of this year? Are my knees wet? Is my house underwater? Is my road underwater? And we weren't getting that from those, you know, you know those traditional tools and visuals. So um, at the same time, my colleagues on the East Coast were doing the same thing, and they were smarter <laughs> and came up with, hey, why don't we? actually model sea level rise and then put it in an online viewer and um, look at something like Google Maps and overlay the model and visualize, hey, this is what it looks like. This is what sea level rise looks like. There's your house. There's your emergency services. There's your school. There's your roads. You know, they're underwater. What are you going to do about it? And so that's what, that's where Coastal Resilience was born. And Coastal Resilience, this is a, the Nature Conservancy's you know, kind of branded tool. And now, since then, there's a bunch of other tools. NOAA's got a sea level rise viewer. There's a bunch going on. And, um, but we were the first, <laughs> And um, what ours is is a global network to de um, dedicated to protecting human and natural communities. So again, we're mixing that, that human and nature interface. It's not just about protecting conservation for conservation. It's about drawing in that other audience and saying, hey, this is going to be a benefit for you too, and this is why. So what we do with Coastal Resilience, aside from just having that visualization tool and having the best available science, is that we have this kind of you know, four-step process. And again, that, that leads into that scaling up, is that we assess risk, and that risk assessment is based in the modeling. And we do, you know, pull together the most, you know, best available science. We're pushing the boundaries with a lot of the modeling um, and pulling in the best knowledge and kind of, you know, putting it out there for people to use. And it's open to the public. And um, coastalresilience.org is our website, and everything's up there. That all the modeling is up there. So not only do we just assess the risk, but then we also identify solutions. So what can you do about this? And you're seeing that your neighborhood is underwater and that your emergency services and your power plant and you know all this are underwater what do you do um, and so there's some solution based um, uh, ideas in there and then there's action oriented as well so what are uh, communities doing how can they actually take action and then the last piece that we're still I think you know really working on I think some of this drone work and uh, monitoring is going to be key to that is measuring effectiveness. Because we have all these great models, but they need to be verified. And so we need to kind of do that circle back loop of, you know, are we getting the best available science? Has things changed? How do we then increase that modeling, get you know the accuracy correct? So that's coastal <coughs> resilience. And so, you know, since we started, started on the East Coast, New York, Long Island, New Jersey, we've got a huge pro project uh, on the Gulf Coast, and a lot of that is actually it's a really great project. So if you guys go online and check out coastalresilience.org, you can go and look at all of the mapping and modeling that's done in the Gulf Coast. A lot of that is um, from the oil spill revenue, and they're actually doing 
oyster reef restoration, which is really cool as a part of not only a way to mitigate the oil spill, but also to stop flooding and wave damage. And then we have California. <laughs> And we have one dot in uh, Ventura. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this should be a familiar picture. So this is Santa Clara River with our ag fields and you know, the city of Oxnard kind of in the background. <clears throat> and so we've been working, the Nature Conservancy has been working in Ventura County since 1999. And, you know, <clears throat> We were talking earlier down at the barbecue that you know Ventura County is it's the uh, really it's, you know this area that so much is happening at and it's you know, you know there's everything happening that's happening throughout the state in this small kind of subset of California and so you know we see Ventura County is a way to prove out a lot of these ideas in an area that ha you know is you know relatively small line of coastline, you know, several miles in coastline. And, but what do we have? We have a major river, two major river systems, I think three, you know, if you count I guess it's a little bit smaller, but definitely, you know, an interesting river system. We have masses amounts of open space still um, along the coast and inland. We have urban, suburban, the highest agricultural value in you know, the United States, always within the top 10, if not top five, agricultural producers. On top of that, the highest um, land value of ag in the United States. We have a Superfund site, two um, once through cooling power plants. What else? Oh, yeah, um, the Nature Conservancy has a lot of land holdings that is the coast. We have um, an environmental <laughs> justice issue on the, at the community where there's not a lot of access to the beach and there's low-income communities being impacted by things like the Superfund site and the power plant. So there's so much going on in this small area. And so <coughs> why not prove out coastal resilience here? Um, and so that's what we did. And you know, on top of all that, we were able to do it here in Ventura because the Nature Conservancy had been engaged in here for, since 1999, like I said. And we've been working and establishing relationships um, since then, and we're able to, you know, we know the community, and again, this is the idea of place-based conservation. We know the community, we know the players. We need this information for our own conservation and restoration work. We need it to help inform restoration and land acquisition along the coast of Norman Beach, where we own 277 acres, um, and where we own all these green properties along the Santa Clara River. We have, I think, 30, 300 acres in the Santa Clara River right now. So the work that we're doing with coastal resilience not only was you know, you know, spurred because of this great kind of geography, but really because TNC is engaged here, and so it's going to inform our projects too. So the first thing that we did, and this is lessons learned from New York, in New York um, and Long Island on the first Coastal Resilience Project, they went out, built a tool, and like handed it over to the community and said, hey, everybody, we did this great work. You know, use it, please, you know, it's on us. And, you know, lo and behold, no one used it. And it, it didn't have the information. It had some information, but it, it wasn't, the community wasn't engaged. The planners weren't engaged. People who are actually making decisions on the ground weren't engaged in the work. So it wasn't used for, it wasn't developed for them. So, um, our, you know, my New York colleagues, they quickly ratified that, started doing the steering committee meetings and, you know, shifted, and then it started being used. So in Ventura, the first thing that we did was like, oh, you know, we gotta pull together a steering committee because we don't want this to be a nature conservancy project. We want it to be used by the decision makers on the ground because that's how, that's what it's there for. We don't want to create a tool that's just going to be good for us and then drop it into the community. So the first thing we did was pull together a steering committee. This is a snapshot of the majority <coughs> of participants. We had about a two-year commitment, and then we met a few times after that, and we've kind of meet periodically. We haven't had a meeting in a while, but um, they were there to drive the entire project. 
and not only to drive the project to help us make decisions on what's needed, what's important, but how can it be used for, say, the planners in the city of Oxnard and the planners in the county of Ventura? What information do they need to actually incorporate our sea level rise model um, into their planning decision tools, whether that's uh, a local coastal plan or zoning, something around those. So what do you need? And that's what they told us. And a lot of it was you know, really kind of surprising that not only did people show up, and you know, our steering committee kind of grew from 30 to about 50 um, folks who were there the whole time, they showed up, they participated, and then they used the information. So it was like actually the, the proof was in the concept that that really works. And so you know, we had all these people engaged and everybody from you know, the sheriff's office who are dealing with emergency services and routes and they are gonna use this information to inform their emergency services and how to move people during flooding to um, the Navy who are a massive coastal landowner to you know, the regulators like the Coastal Commission, the Coastal Conservancy which was a funder. Um, so you know, we had a diverse group of folks in the room who are actually the ones making decisions on the ground. And so this is the output, kind of the major output of our coastal resilience tool. And um, it, this is uh, high, let, let's see, this is 2000, so this is a high sea level rise scenario, um, and this is a combined hazard. So we know, so when I talked about using the best available science, that's exactly what we did, is that we pushed the boundaries before people were doing what's called bathtub models, which were just, you know, the sea rises and then it goes down. And there's not any outside forces. And we know that that's not correct. We know that erosion happens because we're seeing that right now. We know that the rivers flood and then push more sediment out and either deposit sediment or increase erosion. We know that there's a lot of different things that are playing with the impacts of sea level rise. So that's what we did. We combined all the hazards. So we looked at erosion, sea level rise in different years and different scenarios, um, wave run up, fluvial flooding in the Santa Clara River, Ventura River and Cayugas Creek, um, and a whole suite of other models. See, it's probably tidal inundation, wave impact. So we looked at that and we looked at it over different time horizons. And um, this is really you know, the main thing that came out of it is that you know, we see a lot of inundation coming in certain areas in Ventura in you know, the near future. So this is 2100, so this is kind of the, actually I think this is, I should have looked at, this might not be the high scenario. But one thing to point out, and I'll show this more so, but this is kind of a uh, pulled out view um, of the coastal area of Ventura County. You see a lot of flooding in, um, in Oregon Beach area and the Oxnard Plain. Kind of expected, right? Oxnard Plain, you guys see it every day. It's flat, it's wide, it's low. <laughs> uh, it was what, salt flats and then, um, and then coastal wetlands prior to being converted to ag. You get a lot of flooding coming from the Santa Clara River. And so that combined with sea level rise and storm surge, that's gonna be a really big issue. Um, and you know, we have said this for a long time before, but the, you know, the Santa Clara River, it's got this massive, you know, watershed, huge watershed dumping, you know, Mississippi flows of sediment and water down when it does um, flow. And then it all comes shooting like a fire hose out right at this pinch point at the 101, and there's development right there. Um, and historically that's flooded in the past. There was a 69 flood that blew out the harbor, brand new harbor at that time. So we see, you know, kind of these repeated areas but it's an increase even more because when you add that kind of threat multiplier of sea level rise, then you're not only getting whoop, you're not only getting uh, flooding, but you're getting you know the coastal impacts too, and it's increasing everything. So this is a close up of the Navy property, and so one of our major partners prior to Coastal Resilience, just because we're all working down in Norman Beach, the Nature Conservancy. This is Magoo Lagoon. Um, you know, Cayugas Creek is up here. You guys are up there. We, the Nature Conservancy, own this property over here. Coastal <coughs> Conservancy owns this property. So there's a lot of conservation in there, a lot of large landowners. And we're working to acquire more property we have for a long time. And 
The Navy has been a big conservation partner. They're mandated through the Sykes Act to maintain natural resources and endangered species on their property. So a lot of places, and I've worked, you know, especially um, in the south, the Navy bases sometimes are the only places with endangered species, like, you know, good habitat and good population. So you know, I gotta give credit to the Department of Defense for that. The Navy here in Naval Base Ventura County, they've been great partners. And they were, you know, we brought them in at the beginning for the steering committee for coastal resilience. And you know, we went through it with their scientists and they brought their base planners on. Because that's what a lot of people during our steering committee, first round of people that came on were like all the science staff of these organizations were like, no, you know, send your scientists back. We don't want the scientists, we want the planners. We want the people who are actually making decisions, the policy makers, and so we had that kind of shift over. So when we got these results, the Navy was like, oh, we gotta show this to our base leadership. So this is what we presented to the base leadership like uh, two years ago. So today, 2030, this is um, inundated water. So this is flooding and pink. 2060 and 2100. So you can see that um, they have something to worry about. And you know, they, it's not hugely new to them because you know, they're seeing impacts right now. I mean, they are, have lost, um, let's see if you can see it from here. So they have you know, historic buildings down along the beach um, and they had to do some um, relocation. Their roads get inundated on the beach on a regular basis now over the last couple of years more and more frequently. Um, so, you know, they kind of know what's going on. But to see this and to think about how critical this base is, not only to Ventura County, because it's the number one employer in Ventura County, but because of, you know, mission success, that they, you know, this airfield. Um, which runs down here, takes every you know, um, airplane or fleet or you know, whatever the technical term for it is um, that the Department of Defense has. So they, you know, this is critical. They have, you know, whatever their you know, creepy missile testing across from <laughs> San Nicolas Island all the way out to the desert. And, you know, they're doing a lot of things here that is critical for mission. And so they saw this and they're like, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we can't move. You know, w there's pressure a lot to close bases. They don't want to do that. We don't want to lose it in Ventura County. And we don't want to lose it and lose Magoo Lagoon, which is a massive. So right now, Magoo Lagoon is the largest coastal wetland in Southern California. I mean, that's huge for conservation. And it's protected, and no one can go out there, which is you know, bad in some cases, but pretty much awesome all around <laughs> any other way. So we brought this to them, and we said, hey, you know, let's do something about this. And so, so that's what we did, and we're doing right now. And so they, you know, the Navy, as they are, they're like, all right, let, we can do something about it. So let's harness the resources. And you know, then I come to find out that the Nature Conservancy and Department of Defense have worked together since the late 80s and had um, an agreement to work together on protecting um, open space and doing conservation management. That agreement didn't really incorporate a lot of the things we're working on now. So I'm working with um, the um, Navy Region Southwest to create, um, which is almost done, a, um, a management or a working agreement um, uh, to have the Nature Conservancy work with Department of Defense and Navy on managed retreat for coastal bases. And it's gonna be playing out here in Ventura. And then this information then is gonna be exported, again, scaled up to all the coastal bases that are impacted by sea level rise. And so that's huge. And what makes it huge is that they're such a big landowner and they're so you know, important and they can actually get things done. But at the same time that we're talking about this and trying to negotiate, you know, how this is actually going to work out and showing them these maps, at the same time the president comes down with a mandate to, to develop co uh, resilience to climate change through Department of Defense. And so now it's part of the Navy's mandate and Department of Defense's mandate to not only create 
resilient infrastructure because it's an issue of national security to be resilient to climate change. But within that, they have to do a public-private partnership to find solutions. So it's like, hey, right here, <laughs> we're doing this. Let's, let's do it. So we're working on that right now. This is going to be a big project that we're working on in the next few years. And the idea is, is that let's use natural infrastructure. We can't use it all the time, 100%. But what we can do is do a hybrid approach, and that's kind of what we're talking about in these urban areas, or you know, kind of semi-urban areas. So you know, where possible, let's use natural infrastructure. So what I mean by that is, you know, let's make sure Magoo Lagoon is protected. Let's reconnect the hydrology of Magoo Lagoon up to Ormond Beach. I mean, this isn't old stuff, or this isn't new stuff. This is old. We've been talking about this for years and years. This has been part of the restoration planning process for Ormond Beach, but now it's got a new spin on it. It's got new interests and potentially new funding sources. So it's just kind of shifting your vocabulary and your communication tools to, kind of to talk about conservation in a different way that bring other people in, like the Navy. Um, so, you know, expanding the hydrology, reconnecting the hydrology under the um, airfield, and then protecting the floodplains and reconnecting the floodplains of Cayugas Creek so the water's not shooting down right now because it's there's ag levees and um, the water's just kind of shooting straight down. But if you can either do a conservation easement or buy the ag lands outright and reconnect the Cayugas Creek with its natural floodplain, all that water spreads out over its natural floodplain and slows it down so it's not just coming straight onto the base. So doing things like that are you know, relatively straightforward solutions. And so we're working, um, the, once we get going, the Navy will be um, modeling the economics of these different opportunities. So showing, hey, what if we do this hybrid approach? Um, and, you know, moving some of the infrastructure. So the base was built in the 60s. Everything's spread out. You have to drive everywhere. Let's just kind of move it out of the flood zone, or the future flood zone and you know, rebuild some of the buildings. You don't have to do levees around everything. And then do that hydraulic connection, the floodplain um, protection, Cayugas Creek. That's one way we could do it. Another way is you could just do you know, a seawall protecting the whole base. Let's do an economic cost comparison to see which one's cheaper, which one you know, works better. Um, we did this recently in Ventura, and we're doing it in Monterey right now. The natural um, approach, the natural infrastructure solution part, above and beyond, is cheaper, more cost effective, cost effective in the long run, and also in the short term. It's kind of this like you know really easy, straightforward. Hey, let's do this where we can. So it's going to be exciting to be able to prove it out here on the base. So. Another one of those kind of like proof is in the concept is that, so we saw the Navy, you know, we brought this tool, had the steering committee, the Navy saw it, now we're doing something with the Navy. Another end of that is that, so we had this tool, City of Oxnard, they were on the steering committee. They took the information and used the information to approve a moratorium on coastal power plants. I mean, that, uh, we weren't ever even expecting that to happen. And here, this is one of the first, I mean, I think I haven't found any other, but <laughs> <laughs> so what a, this is the first use of sea level rise in a planning decision, in a municipal planning decision, to actually stop development. I mean, that's really cool. This made national news. This is awesome, and it's happening just here. And I mean, you know, the, it's, the mayor pro tem is like, why would you want to build, uh, you know, critical infrastructure <coughs> in a floodplain. It just doesn't make sense. And so, you know, the Nature Conservative, we don't weigh in on any of these things. <laughs> <laughs> what we think is great is they use our science, they use the best available science to make a planning decision based on that, a lot, you know, in part, using that. And there's a huge amount of community support, there's environmental justice components, so there's a lot going on. But really, the crux of it is that they saw the modeling. And then, they, then now it's going through this whole process, and I'm sure you guys are more familiar than I am, but it's going through the regulatory process um, through the Public Utilities Commission. And again, the Sierra Club, uh, State Sierra Club attorneys, 
it's kind of a quasi litigation. They used our model and said, why would you want to build in floodplain? Um, and that the idea of reliability, which is what the you know Edison and the um, and uh, NRG are saying, we need to have reliability on the grid here. So Sierra Club flipped their argument and said, you want reliability? Don't build in the floodplain. And they won. I mean, it's just like, hey, that just you know, you put the best available information out there, and it's actually being used, and that's that's really cool. So we love this kind of stuff, even though we can't like this. <laughs> so um, you know, again about that scalability, we did it in Ventura. We're not going to be doing it throughout um, the state. We're not doing Venturas everywhere. Um, we've got a couple of different geographies where we're engaging these like key spots like Ventura, so mainly Ventura, um, Humboldt, and then the Santa Cruz Monterey area um, are gonna be our kind of flagship coastal resilience projects because they have that same, the same components that Ventura has where it's, a, you know, um, it's the idea of you know, what's happening on, throughout the coast is happening in these communities. <coughs> And we have people actually working there, so that's helpful too. <laughs> <laughs> but we do, um, we have two other coastal resilience projects too that are, um, I'm working on Santa Barbara came online, um, and this was another really great uh, proof is in the concept. They saw our work and they were coming to some of our steering committee meetings. They're like, we wanna do this in Santa Barbara, this is awesome. So they went out and got funding and then we just guided them through the process and they've taken it on on their own and we're hosting all the information on our website. But you know, we're just minimally, it's like a light touch engagement. Um, Los Angeles, we're doing um, a project that I'm just kind of kicking off right now. It's really, I think it's fun. Um, it's uh, working with partners down there, but looking at sea level rise um, and ability for natural infrastructure in a developed area, as well as um, uh, um, uh, low-income communities and job centers. So how, where that area kind of all intertwines. And so that's gonna be really exciting, just uh, kind of wrapping it up this year. It should end in like December. So those are kind of the, the key projects that we're doing within the coastal resilience um, landscape in California. We've got, what came out of the Ventura work was this idea that there's a lot of people, a lot of practitioners throughout the state doing similar work. So we pulled together what we call the Coastal Resilience Network. And we have um, calls on a regular basis where we um, uh, do presentations and kind of webinars and informational um, uh, meetings on like a methodology of economics or addressing policy. And so we're really tackling questions. So that's been um, pretty great and actually helpful for a lot of people. We're working, like I talked about earlier, this economics model. So what happened with um, sea level rise modeling is that once, you know, we've done it, and then all of a sudden everybody started doing it, and there's like the competing models, and you know, everyone's like, my science is better than yours, my approach. Uh, you know, okay, that's, you know, great, it's a model. You know, they all kind of say the same thing. You know, it's gonna change in a couple of years anyway. So <laughs> what we're trying to do with the economics is stop that from happening. So we want to, we're trying, we're gathering all of the you know, economists and all the people who are working in the area and trying to come up with a better approach, a methodology, methodology to value nature, to value <laughs> natural infrastructure, and kind of move that forward as a general thought as opposed to having you know, practitioners kind of fighting internally. Um, so similarly, we're taking all this information and influencing state policy. Um, whether that's with the Coastal Commission and their recent guidance on sea level rise or something broader that we're just kind of trying to think of right now. That's something that we're doing. And we've got these key partnerships too um, that we're working on and these are you know, major landowners throughout the coast. And just you know, wrapping up, I've got a couple more minutes. So, so my, those are, that's kind of the crux of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but because the Nature Conservancy is a large organization and we are flexible, in a sense, to jump into <coughs> emerging threats, which is like so cool and fun to do. So emerging threats, you know, we see, we have these like, you know, conservation issues that we can forecast out, like climate change. I mean, it definitely, it's a huge threat and it's emerging on the slow scale, but it's not something we need to deal with now. Um, so there are things <coughs> like desalinization. We don't know a lot about it, 
Um, we don't know, and this is actually a uh, once through cooling power plant in Huntington Beach, that a desal plant is being proposed, like right here next to it. And so this is happening throughout the state. There's 17, and I think maybe the number just dropped, desal um, plants being proposed or in like some part of the permitting process throughout the state. Desal could be a really great option um, if it's planned right. And we just, we don't know enough about it. So we know that the science in California that's, in, that's influencing the permitting and policy of desal is pretty good with the um, intake and um, subsurface intakes now. And, you know, they've refined that. But the siting and the need is really industry driven. So, you know, we're trying to kind of learn more about it. And this is an emerging threat. So last year we had um, you know, an internal discussion about, hey, this has been coming up a lot. I've been dealing with it out in Ormond. What should we do about it? And so um, we were able to pull together like a pretty quick and dirty team to do a small <coughs> desal project. And so I'm not going to show you actually what it all is because we still haven't, um, I'm going up next week to get the like thumbs up from leadership that we can talk about it publicly. But what it was is that we pulled together, we did a spatial analysis of you know, these proposed desal plants and looked at it um, on the coastal side of you know, where they are, if they're adjacent to wetlands, nursery, estuaries, um, the vulnerability to sea level rise, adjacency to conservation <coughs> intakes. And then on the marine side, if they're you know, next to kelp forest, deep water, um, near nursery, estuaries, and protected areas. Um, so just by doing that spatially and putting it on a map, People have been working in the kind of you know desal advocacy um, on the environmental side. They've never seen it like this, and it gave, it just kind of shifts the conversation to see where should we focus our energy on. Uh, you know, maybe there's plants that aren't going to be important because they're right next to you know um, developed areas, and they're you know the technology is fine. But then there's some that aren't. So. It just kind of shifts it, and it, it's a, that ability to use science and to jump into a conversation to inform it so people can make better decisions. So the interesting too, thing, too, is at the same time that we were looking at these desal plants, um, the once through cooling power plants is also an issue, and they're all you know, coming offline or going to be updated by 2020, the technology. And they are being co-located. Right. These yellow spots are the co-located um, desal and once through cooling. So that just adds to the threat um, and the unknown, really. So that's another one where we're doing the spatial analysis of similar to what we did with desal, but looking at, and this is um, the Mandalay plant, you know, looking at these and looking at where, you know, where, where are those undeveloped uplands, where are the marine protected areas. You know, where should we focus our energy, if any? And then this is kind of a funky picture, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the same thing goes for um, Superfund sites. <laughs> so if you, and this is the worst thing, you can go on the EPA Superfund website and map Superfund sites. And, they, you know, all over the United States, it's just like a red smear of dots where the Superfund sites are. They're all over, and they're all over the coast. And this is Foreman Beach. So this is the Nature Conservancy's property. We actually own a Superfund site, we're, or a Superfund adjacent, <coughs> and we're part of the Superfund cleanup area. And then this is the Halico um, uh, um, site slide heap, which is fun to say. Um, so think about this um, when you go, guys, go check out Coastal Resilience. Go look at the modeling as it pertains to the Superfund site. Yeah. How is it called a Superfund site? Um, Superfund is a law. And so it's a super fun law, and it triggers a cleanup through the EPA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And a future attorney in the house. <laughs> um, so there's sites like this all over the coast. And so how do we then do that same spatial analysis, identify where they are, identify the priority, if they're adjacent habitat like this one is, or potential habitat. And then how do we then expedite that cleanup, which is, uh, I don't know do that yet. <laughs> Maybe some policy play, but you know, this is a reality in our community, and it's a reality in a lot of different communities throughout um, the state. So this is you know a pretty big deal, and so we can do that same thing as just deploy. And this is one of those you know, 
threats, those emerging threats that I'm working on, deploy a small amount of energy really quick with a quick turnaround to address these not only locally but kind of more on a broad scale. And then um, this is something that we've just, another emerging threat, El Nino, everyone's talking about it, it's in the news, we haven't had it yet, really here, <laughs> still waiting. <laughs> uh, but what we've done is, you know, we decided that, hey, we, let's monitor it, let's start validating our, um, our models by using El Nino, and we couldn't do that alone. And so what we did is we decided to engage citizen um, scientists and the community around the state and say, hey, you're out on the beach, use your phone. Are you a drone operator? Use your drones. We now we've got the Phones and Drones project. And um, it got a lot of press, and it's been really kind of cool. We're just waiting for um, the impacts of, of El Nino to come through. But um, it's one way that we're out there, so we're able to get the community to go out to the coast and either take a picture of you know where you're at at high tide, with, take a picture of your feet, take a picture of the you know, landscape during um, a, an event you know, usually after an event, because you don't want to be in the way of, you know, high tide event. Um, or you can go up afterwards to the rack line and do the same thing. Um, if you're a drone operator, go out there with your drone and take video, upload it to our Flickr page. This is on coastal resilience. All the information is up there. We have um, a, a lot of, you know, um, uh, directions and video and links to all the media that we've got. So it's been pretty fun to work on that as well. And so part of that, too, is that um, in November, October, November, I worked with a local photographer to put up time-lapse video in um, Magoo Lagoon, the Pier in Ventura, Surfers Point, and, and then Santa Cruz Island, and then Elkhorn Slough. And so now we have time-lapse video also to help with that validation of our models and just to look at different ways to communicate impacts of storm surges that are happening now and that could be happening more and more in the future. And this is just some of the media footage from the phones and drone stuff. I mean, we got national news, a couple like, the, the, I don't know if they've just been talking too much about El Nino, but um, you know, KTLA picked it up, CBS picked it up. Um, it was, yeah, it's been a great project and a fun way to engage people for them, not only just to help us with the science, but then to learn about the organization and what matters to us. And that's it. <laughs>